We're here at Zilla and uh, we're gonna get a grand tour of their lab and all of their awesome setups and things. So in their office space, they're encouraged to have stuff like this. It's just amazing. What kind of business has places where they're like, hey, you should keep some really cool, awesome animals at your desk or just sitting in the hallway. Beautiful stuff. So make sure you guys watch the rest of this video, check it out, and uh, you'll be hearing from Bill Stewart here, as well, Ryan's running around here somewhere. Right. So stay tuned, guys. That's it. No, so what's really cool about about this uh, this building and, and the, uh, the people who work here, there are people that are in part of manufacturing and have been for 40 years. It, it's awesome. Uh, it's a really great family and group of people. But what else is cool is some of the historical stuff we have. So this tank is one of the original tanks made by Allglass when they started 50 years ago. Um, and this was made by, uh, there was a pizza store down the street from the guy that I can't remember his name and I suck at that, but um, that started all glass. But they, he, there's a pizza store that went out of business uh, and he took the glass and cut it and then made this fish tank with wood framing and silicone and glued it all together. And this was one of the first aquariums ever built. So this is kind of a really cool piece because it's That's this crazy. old, crazy, busted old aquarium. But this is like, this is the start of where the hobby, this started the aquatics hobby, which built into the tanks we use for reptile. This was the tank, one of the tanks that started that. That's awesome, man. It's great, you guys. Yeah, it's really cool. Well, that's what's neat, just the history behind it and understanding how we've grown as a hobby and how we've, where we've come from and the advances and, uh, you know, UV and things like that, making chameleons no longer a unicorn. Like mm -hmm. these major points that people take for granted now, it's really awesome to be able to see the historical track of how that happened. Absolutely. And it really helps us as a, as a, as a brand too, to, to, to look at how, where is it going? Where's the hobby going? Where's it been? And how, what are the next steps we need to make? Where are we, yeah. where are we, where have we plateaued? Cause husbandry should never plateau. We should always be advancing it. And that's Absolutely, the options yeah. we have to look at all that and say, oh, we've been using the same lights for a long time. We use Edison screw in bulbs. Like, I don't even have, do you have the same cell phone Thomas Edison had? No, but, right? But you, it, it, technology advances and everybody just sits there and we have an opportunity to looking through the past and looking at where we've come to really have a good vision of what the future needs. And that's, that's really what Zilla and me are focused on is what's the future and how do we make things continuously better? And having a good idea of what the past was is a good way to do that. Yeah, it's a good reminder of how far we've come in this hobby. And I, you know, the, the tanks and displays and cages that we have now are completely different than oh, what God, they all looked like 10 years ago even. Yeah, right. And I think about the cages that I had for my animals even 10, 20 years ago and how much they've evolved and changed since then. Oh, so here, even look at this tank. These so things are a good reminder. This is one of the old original tanks too where they're using metal frames and the bottom is made out of slate. Oh wow. It's not glass. So you can see in there that slate. Now, all of the original fish tanks had slate bottoms. That's crazy. So imagine, I mean, like you lift this thing. This is incredibly heavy <laughs> for a 20 long. It's about the heavy weight of a 55 gallon tank. Yeah. Um, but this is this is where it started. Tons of extra padding, tons of silicone, um, and then just this metal welded frame. I mean. And just imagine the shag carpeting and yeah. the paneling <laughs> behind so it. How beautiful that would look. The orange and yellow <laughs> and brown yellow yarn shag. Couch. Yeah. <laughs> but like just awesome. This is this is pretty amazing, you know. <laughs>
Yeah, let's but, do it. Yeah, no, so right now we're in our R&D department. Um, this is all our designers, uh, engineers, um, and these guys kind of help us to work on the product. So uh, I might come up with an idea and I'll come down and talk to some of these guys and we'll start hashing out what that's gonna look like, drawing it out, coming up with the right manufacturer who we wanna work with to start working with these ideas and develop it and then go back and forth, go through multiple rounds and iterations of, of development till we really get it where we want it. And then, then it comes back on to me to create packaging, get us get a story together to launch it and get it out to the public, get the information, instruction sheets and really round out how we want people to understand what this is and get it out there. But these guys are the, the ones that are in the trenches at first and really helping to make sure like is if it's a tank, is it gonna leak? If it's a if it's a piece of decor, scrubbing it and beating it up and trying to find the failure points so that we can create a better, stronger product. Awesome. So as we're testing a lot of our products in here, and here's our warm, uh, our, our heat fireproof room. We use this to test a lot of lighting and heat mats and things like that. We're going, we're looking at these heat mats to make sure that they have uniform heat, that there's no hot spots, um, and, and that they work the way we want them to, that they don't overheat. Uh, we'll power surge them and give them a ton of, of electricity and amperage to try and melt them and mess with them, scratch them, hit them. I really focus and so do, so do our R&D guys on failure testing because I don't want to just know that it works. I want to know how it's going to fail, where it's weak and where we can make it stronger and better for your animals, for your house. Uh, heat mats and fires are one of the scariest things for reptile owners. Um, so having heat mats that can't start on fire that um, we've tested and the ones that we have, especially when it comes to heat mats, the heat mats we have are a carbon fiber material that can't overheat. It physically, the material can't get hotter than 113 degrees. Um, the only times we've had failure issues is when someone had a power surge and the, and the amperage going through the core was so high it melted the metal, but it didn't melt the heat source. So, I mean, if you have an amperage high enough to melt the cord, I can't really stop that from melting. Um, but it's those extreme cases is what it took to, for ours to have a failure. Pretty cool. All right, so we're gonna walk down here. This is where all the animals in the lab are. So we call it a lab, but it's a husbandry lab. I wanna make that clear. We don't test on animals. It's all husbandry things. So Just testing the product. Are the animals gonna eat the food? Are they doing well when they eat it? If we beat, if they, if it's a piece of decor and they beat the crap out of it, how's it gonna fail or how's it gonna last? So we have two different rooms. Uh, they're temperature controlled. They have their own air conditioning systems. This is our cold room or our tropical room and our hot room, which is our desert room. Hot as in warm, not venomous. We don't have any venomous animals here. Um, but in here, we've got a lot of animals that are more temperature sensitive. So Amphibians, you um, uh, New Caledonian geckos, things like that. So uh, we keep this room at 70. And again, the uh, I'm here. I'm the lab tech. I'm here to take care of the animals and make sure that they're healthy and make sure that they're um, healthy. What else? <laughs> um, but we're also testing the product. So once Ryan comes up with an idea and then um, yeah, the lychees. I cleaned them last week and they're just filthy animals. They're called leaky anus geckos yeah. for a reason. Um, once uh, Ryan gets tangible um, prototypes for products, we keep them in the lab here for a few months and we test their durability, their efficacy, every little detail, like Ryan said, you know, we want to make sure they work, but we want to look at what areas could they fail. Um, like the vertical decor, we've had the vertical decor in here for months now, making sure that the suction cups stick, that the decor can take a beating, um, that they can take a, a you know scrubbing without the paint coming off. Just um, as a heads up too, a lot of this stuff gets really strength tested. So the vertical decor was actually tested in tanks with five pounds of lead on it. Um, so you're never going to have a five pound gecko sitting on there. I mean, that's insane. If you do, um, you should <laughs> slow down on that Pangea you're, you're a little animals bit. Animals obese, stop feeding. Cut back on that um, Pangea. <laughs> but no, so we're never going to have something that big, but we push it to the limit and we moved it every week and we tested to make sure it wouldn't fall. Well, you're good. So in here we've got lychees, we've got crested geckos, chihuahua, uh, we've got uridactylodes, um, agricola, you saw those at our house, I've got some at the house too. Mm -hmm. um, neon day geckos, these guys are really cool over here, these are Chacoan monkey frogs. Yeah, yeah. So this is my spirit animal. You wanna zoom in on his face every time you come into my office and ask me a question, that's how I look at you. Um, <laughs> but these guys are cool because they actually bask under 90 degree temperatures and with a waxy coating on their body, they can hold in their humidity. So they actually live in really arid areas. And this is about their, what they do. They just sit there and judge you. They're very <laughs> condescending. Yeah, which is why I love them because yeah. they look at you and- I don't do like, anything right in this room. Leave, I hate you. <laughs> I really love everybody. But we also got, yeah. 
So we also got some stuff like these guys are uh, mantellas, golden mantellas, um, which are critically endangered in the wild. So we're working with a group of these just for, you know, for fun. They're a cool animal and it'd be amazing to be able to reproduce them. And um, most of the animals that reproduce here go into zoos and breeding programs or hobbyists that work with specific animals. We'll give the animals to them to continue working with them. Um, and here we've got like mossy frogs. Um, down here are one of my favorite frogs that we have here. Where are you at? Come here, buddy. We got a whole group in here. But these are Costa Rican crown tree frogs. And you can see that sp those spikes on their head. Those are actually bony protrusions that spike off their skull. And then it's a flesh around it. So if you were to poke that, it's actually a spike, a, a bone spike coming up out of their head. So and these guys are super cool. They change colors throughout the day. Um, and they're obligate egg feeders. So they actually give, they lay their eggs and the tadpoles hatch. And then the females come down and uh, lay infertile eggs for the tadpoles to eat. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So wow. right now I, I, we're looking at things like if I take those eggs and we actually analyze the nutritional content, could we create a food for obligate egg feeders like uh, Pamilio and all the Ufaga frogs and these guys where we could provide a pellet diet where you could actually control their intake of food better than, ask, than hoping mom's doing it. And then we could have better production rates with animals that are endangered where that's a limited resource for mom to feed them. Well, if we take that effort off her, we could have more of the babies make it and then be able to produce more and grow more of a captive population. That's awesome. Yeah, man. They keep me busy down here, that's for sure. Cold room slash closet. And this is where we keep a lot of the animals that are less temperature sensitive um, so they can handle fluctuations. Um, and then there's a lot more stuff in here uh, that we just don't have to worry about overheating if something goes wrong. Yeah, we keep um, this room about 74. Everything has basking spots, but it kind of, you know, the, the, the ambient temperature is in the low 70s in here. So it's not necessarily a desert room. There are a lot of tropical animals in here. But again, my role in here is to make sure that the animals are clean, the cages are clean, the animals are healthy. And um, it's also to test the product. So like Ryan said, we're a husbandry lab. We're not an animal testing lab. But I'm testing to make sure that the products are durable, that they're holding up, that they're meeting the needs. Um, the big goal with Zilla is we want to make sure that if we have a kid who's buying his first leopard gecko or first corn snake, that they're going to have a rewarding experience, that the animal's going to be alive and healthy, and then that's going to encourage him to want to be part of the hobby maybe, uh, to continue keeping reptiles as pets. If a kid has their first lizard and it's a bad experience, they're not going to want to keep lizards anymore. And so we're trying to do the best job that we can to come up with the best products that we can to uh, not only gear it towards, you know, people that keep and people that, you know, maintain these animals regularly, but for newcomers into the hobby and, and younger kids who want to have a successful experience with their animals. So we have some rare animals in here. We have some common animals in here. We have an old leopard gecko that's been here for a long time. We have corn snakes, tokay geckos, and then we do have some more unusual species that um, Ryan and I can highlight for you here. Yeah, so we'll kind of start over here. Um, when this lab, when I fir uh, first started with Zilla, this lab had a couple random animals here and there, um, but I really wanted to change the way we looked at it. Everything in here has different diets, different EUV intensity needs, different heat needs. Um, so we have uh, uh, we have diurnal animals, nocturnal, crepuscular. We have omnivore, herbivore, insectivore, carnivore, piscivore. We have something that eats anything. We have stuff that needs high UV, no UV. So there's something in here, no matter what I de we develop, as, and whatever the team comes up with, we have something that makes a good thing, a good animal to try it on and see how they react to make sure that it's a positive experience for the animal as well as um, the owner and the keeper. Because I want to make something that's really cool for the animal, but it's a nightmare for you to clean. Right. That takes away from your want to do it. So we kind of test a lot of that stuff. Um, these up here are cool. These are our new, this is the first time anyone's seen them on video. So these are our new uh, micro habitats. They're going to launch in a couple months. Uh, they just launched to the pu uh, for the public to see them at the Global Pet Expo last week. Um, but these are a really cool small acrylic habitat. They, they come together flat. They all snap together with these silicone bands. And it's perfect for small amphibians, uh, a lot, anybody that's an invertebrate keeper. They stack. Um, it's just a really, really cool way to keep at these animals, and it's going to be at a much lower price point, more entry level than your custom acrylic. Um, so it's kind of a unique thing. I, I've been using these at home for probably four months, and we've gone through a bunch of different iterations and tweaks to really make them the coolest thing that we could possibly do. So it's an enclosure that has a hinged door, a locking mechanism, but there's no welded components. They all snap together. Um, so in here we've got uh, a bunch of different frogs and things like that, some invertebrates. In here are one of my favorite animals we have in the lab. Um, we've been breeding these for four years, and I just think we need to get a ton more because I really love them. Um, we need an army of them. Right? Anybody who doesn't have these is missing out. So these are 
Tribulonatus gracilis, which is also known as the red-eyed crocodile skink. So what's rad about these is they're, they're maternal. They actually care for their babies. Um, so she's actually gravid. So and they only have one ovary, so they only lay one egg at a time. It's one of the reasons you don't see a lot of people breeding them in captivity is you're taking a lot of care for a pair of animals that give you one baby every six weeks um, versus some of the stuff that has a clutch of 40 eggs. It's a little more financially viable for them. Every six um, weeks, though, is pretty good because there's animals out there that are like, oh, two eggs a year. Right. Yeah. So and that's the thing. And it's, and it's almost like clockwork. The cool thing is, so she lays an egg. Eight weeks later, it hatches. But at six weeks, she's laid another one. So six weeks after that, that one hatches and it's a cycle. The older babies will help take care of the younger ones. These guys take, they kind of are protective. You gotta be careful keeping them in anything more than a pair. You kind of either have to do a pair or a giant group. Um, if you do trios the, and one female lays an egg, she'll, she can kill the other female if she gets too close. They're very protective. Um, but they're super rewarding species. We let the babies live in here for a little while and just sit with mom. We throw in small crickets for them to eat. Um, and then after a little while, we take them out so that we can, in a different cage, so that we can monitor them better, make sure they're eating. Um, Cause when they're with mom and dad, it's hard to tell if they're doing a good job taking care of them. And I don't want to wait till it's too late for us to help them if they decide not to be as good of parents as we need them to be for that baby. And how hard is it to keep them? I know when we were looking at them, I've seen people say that they uh, should be kept in like a full aquatic tank almost. and i'm learning yeah. more and more and that's <laughs> not true it's there's so much bad information where these guys are from think of like a bog okay there's a lot of water it's real squishy ground if you were to step on it you'd be up to your you know shin and water or your ankle um but it's still surfaces they can climb on where they're not wet so it's kind of like that um so they need moisture they like a lot of water but we had them in a tank when i originally got them we had them in a tank that was 25 percent land the rest was water mm -hmm. they never went in the water ever um, so we switched it up and this is instead a water bowl with a lot of wet dirt, a nice humid hide over here for them to hide in. Um, and this is perfect. They never, they're constantly breeding. They're very uh, subtle and quiet and timid. So they, they're kind of shy. You don't see them a lot, um, but just another amazing animal. So since we're at the Zillow Lab end, we have one of the guys, top guys in the country on husbandry of different animals. Break it down. What's exactly in there? So. There's what kind of dirt, what kind of uh, yeah. sphagnum moss. I see you got some cork bark. Ryan loves cork bark because it's like the most valuable thing in the world. Oh, this is this is this is natural <laughs> gold. Yep. Yeah. You know, but like so basically what we have in here, it's really simple. We have a big water bowl on one side, then we have some hides laid laid throughout. We have this big cork bark that kind of shadows it all. And then we just jam a plant in here because it makes us feel better. Um, and it kind of gives them a little bit more place to kind of hide and peek around again because they're shy. A lot of little hides are good. Um, this is uh, the Zilla rock layer. This is a humid hide, but it kind of doubles as a, a nest box. And usually, I, don't think, I think she's I, got her egg yeah, in her. We're, are, we're getting another egg any day now. Yeah, like, she's grabbing. So she'll it, yeah. she'll actually lay it in here, yeah. and then she'll they'll both sit in here and guard it. And that's sphagnum moss in there. How yep. often do you wet the sphagnum moss? Well, like, the nice thing is with the rock layers. Really. Yeah, with the rock layers. I mean, you're check. Bill's checking on them pretty regularly. But the nice thing with the rock layers is the way that we designed them. They hold moisture for a really long time. I would say maybe twice a month do you add any moisture to it at all. Oh, um, wow. Versus your standard humid hide where the hole in the entrance is in the top. That's just a chimney for the heat and the humidity to rise out of it. Ours, the entrance is in the side. I can show you. So the entrance is in the side and it rolls up into the top. So what you've got is a pocket for your moss. And then on top, you've got this, this deep dome where people, where they can climb into it. Once you put this on, these two pieces touch and it creates a wall. So what that does is now you've got, light can only travel in a straight line. So the best light can get from here to here to here. And the inside's black, so it's nice and dark in there. It creates a real den, not, if you put a hole in the top of it, it's a skylight. It doesn't hold that darkness that they want. And then the other thing is it kind of helps them to hide and feel more secure. Because of the way the dome is and the door is, the humidity rises to the top, cools down, and comes back down. And you get a natural convection inside here, which keeps the air movement so it doesn't get stagnant. So you don't get nearly as much mold as you would with other containers, and it holds that humidity a lot better. And when we got those in uh, for product testing, I put them in a bunch of different cages and every animal was using them. <laughs> Our uh, the gastrofolus just disappeared in Yeah, rocks. they all hid in rock layers. Our gastrofolus actually thought it was a wonderful idea to lay her eggs glued to the top of the rock layer. 
And I was, <laughs> Ryan always busts my chops. I was scared to pull the eggs off, so I just put the whole rock layer in the incubator. <laughs> yeah, and I came back from a show out of town and was like, dude, and he's like, I don't want to touch it. I had a huge like, deli cup with just the whole rock layer in it with the eggs glued to it. Because, like, yeah, it whatever, it works. It works. But, uh, but yeah, then we've got some Pac-Man frogs and stuff down here. I'm going to save that one for last because that's what everybody wants. We're going to make you guys wait. You guys aren't interested um, in that. Yeah, nobody wants to see Nobody that. wants to see that. These guys are cool. Come here. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> Watch Bill chase the lizard. Yeah, so there's, there's her hanging out. So this is our uh, our climbing toads. That's our female. She's just chilling. Uh, these guys are going to a rain fun. chamber pretty soon. Yeah. She's got a little funny thing on her nose again, dude. Yeah, gotta, she I likes started, to rub. I started it, yeah. These guys are super loud. So when they call, you can hear it anywhere in the building almost. Oh, yeah. they, they used to be in the other room, and on the other side of that was uh, offices. And I got a lot of angry emails. <laughs> what the heck is in that room? It's really loud. I'm like, I oh, know, I'm sorry. This is the Yucatan spiny tail iguana or the Senosaura defensor. Um, cool ass little dude. So he's pretty much full grown. They don't get much bigger than that. So it's an awesome little uh, spiny tail iguana uh, species to keep. Well, we like them because we can, when it comes to iguanids and things like that, like we don't have a lot of room to do giant big enclosures. <laughs> he likes you, man. <laughs> but we don't have room to do giant big enclosures. And with these smaller Tenosaurus, they have a lot of the same requirements as a big iguana, but we can do it in a smaller enclosure and we can manage it better. Yeah. No, but she's in shed right now. Um, but these are really cool. These are broad leaf tail lizards, uh, our geckos. They're from Australia. So this is Phylerus amnicole. Um, just a really unique species. And it's kind of cool to see the. Uh, the evolutionary track between these lizards and then like the leaf tails of Madagascar um, and, and just some of the similarities, but also a lot of differences. Um, these lizards are very laterally compressed. So they look like they got run over by a car and they're just squished flat, but they use that to hide in crevices. Mm -hmm. um, so we can just kind of just keep yeah, going. Let's keep going, yo. So we'll here that. is one of the coolest animals we have. It's something that I really pride ourselves on having and it's awesome. Um, this is Morelia carnata. Come here, sweetie. There you go. You awake? So this is our rough-scaled carpet python. Ryan getting tag shots. Yeah, right. You need more of me getting bit? She's never bit anybody. Except maybe our last me? keeper, Sam. She's bit you? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well. Well, it was my fault, and I deserved it, but I got it right in the knuckle, and it hurt really bad because... They never bite me. Those of you that don't know, these have the longest teeth of any of the uh, carpet python species, so it feels really good going right through your knuckle. Yeah. They're but the cool thing is they're keeled. So if you feel their, here, feel their scales, man. It's keeled. It's the only python species with keeled scales. Oh, look at those silver eyes, too. Yeah, yeah they're beautiful. Beautiful snakes. Yeah. So this guy's really cool. This is a Chinese crocodile lizard, uh, Shinosaurus crocodilius. Um, and these are actually a uh, monotypic genus. This is the only species in that genus, and they're very critically endangered. Um, they're eaten in Asia, um, so their and their habitat is being destroyed and stuff. So very cool lizard to have. Um, and they're pretty much they're very aquatic, um, and they give live birth in the water, which is super cool too. Vibrant colors, really pretty, but crazy strong jaws. Getting bit by one when he's crabby is not fun. Um, they crush snails with their jaws. So you can imagine the pressure it takes to crush a clam or a snail mm. on your hand with, like, with a little tiny Godzilla face. It's, it sucks. <laughs> but they're really unique, really smart animals. Um, so then over here we've got uh, a Solomon Islands uh, sk uh, skink or a monkey tail skink. His name is George. He was actually part of a confiscation that came through Fish and Wildlife and some zoos. Um, it was gifted to the lab. Um, he's a wild caught animal that just hates humans. So we kind of just let him be and do his thing. He's not exactly the cuddliest dude we have. Um, and he spends most of his time hiding. And then you know he's alive because you hear it when he, when he goes to the bathroom, he's real gassy a lot of times. So you just hear this horrible And then you know he's alive. So that's how we know he's in there and he's good as you hear him poop. Um, <laughs> and then in here we've got pink tongue skinks. Uh, we've got a pair of powder blue tokes down here. Uh, this is a female Shinosaurus. Our male is being a little aggressive with her, so uh, we keep a watch on weights and things like that. And she was losing a little weight, and the male was just not giving her the time she needed to get out and eat. So she got pulled away, and now she's on her own, giving her uh, daily care. Make, Bill's doing a lot to make sure she's eating a lot, putting that weight back on. And then we'll get her beef back up, and we'll try again with the male. And if it doesn't work out, um, then we'll look at other options. But um, it's just kind of nice. We, we don't have to breed anything here either, um, but it's kind of nice to, to, to be able to reproduce some of these rare animals, work with zoo and conservation organizations um, and then some of the animals here that aren't super rare it's fun to just kind of have those and see the babies hatch and um, 
the really cool thing about the lab and one of the other big points is everything in here from some of the rarest animals on the planet to leopard geckos are all kept in the same caging, the same lighting, the same decor and dirt. It's all the same stuff. So the, it shows the range of the different products we have and what you can use them for. Um, anything from stuff like, uh, like the uh, Utila Island Iguana, which is critically endangered in the wild, um, and she, the little uh, Tinosaura up there, Baker Eye. She's a little crappy. The second bill opens it, she's probably gonna sprint. But. Yeah, she's not, she doesn't like us. <laughs> Her so, humans. But, uh, but that's cool. At one point there was only like 30 or, I think it was only 30 or 50 of those left in the wild. So, or either that or 300, I my numbers mixed up. But um, wow. at, at one point they were down to a very, very small population. Um, and now there's more produced in captivity than there are in the wild. Um, so it's kind of cool to see that happen and to have an animal like that that's such an ambassador for conservation. Um, and here we've got pancake tortoises. It's kind of have tortoises, and if I'm gonna have a tortoise, I want the squishy little pancake tortoises are way cooler than everything else. Um, they're just kind of hiding in there. And I love bringing these up for education because when you talk to kids about like what makes a turtle versus a tortoise, turtles have flat shells. Turtles are more streamlined. And then I show them this, and I'm like, is it turtle or tortoise? Mm. But one of the big differences is their feet. So turtles have webbed feet and tortoises have more like a, a elephant type okay. stump foot. Stumpy foot, yeah. But what's cool about these guys, why they're so compressed like that, they're actually more squishy than a lot of tortoises as well. You have to be careful because they're not supposed to be spongy squishy, but they are more, uh, they are softer than other tortoises. And the reason is they wedge themselves into rock crevices in the, in the rocks in Africa. And if there's a predator, they inflate their, their lungs and press their, their uh, carapace up into the grooves of the rock makes it impossible for the predator to pull them out. Those are awesome. Yeah, these guys are cool. And they're super personable. They don't get huge. They're easy to care for. Their husbandry is really easy and broad and forgiving. Um, and you got yeah. something on your nose. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and then they're just a unique, really cool, awesome little tortoise. So the fun thing with building this, getting this lab together is we kind of got like a, hey, do what you need to do. You know, so no, but a lot of it is it's very specific and it kind of, again, shows the range of the products, the range of the animals you can keep, um, really what you can do with all of the same stuff. And that's something with reptiles that are a little different from every, every other hobby. The entry level keeper is really gonna use the same stuff as somebody who's been in it for 50 years and is keeping lace monitors or something crazy snake from somewhere. You're using the same equipment. You're just changing the parameters inside of the temperature or the humidity. Really, it's all the same stuff that you're using to do it though. Versus like aquatics, your first fish tank, your entry level fish tank, your goldfish, your betta, is different than your 210 saltwater marine Kessel lighting $20,000 setup. And there's a different stages between beginner and expert. But when it comes to the products for reptile, we all kind of use the same stuff. Yeah. So it, it's all about the husbandry that changes. Um, but this kind of shows that you can use a lot of this stuff on pretty much anything. That's yeah, that's kind of what our what our goal is. And if if I if you can have like a rare animal and it's thriving and it's healthy in captivity with the Zilla products, then you could be confident that you go to the pet shop and buy your leopard gecko tank and supplies and your leopard gecko is gonna be healthy. Yeah. So now 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 we gotta show you the cool stuff. The the, the holy grail, the last thing everybody waits for and I make you wait for it. Alright, so this is this, you know, mildly unique lizard. Some people like it. Um, Ryan's building this one up. <laughs> no. ba -ba -ba -ba. So there's only been a hundred of, the, the, of these ever found in the world. Um, and it's one of the rarest lizards on the planet. So I think more people have touched <laughs> these animals than have ever touched the wild populations. Our water's a little low, but these yeah. guys like low, cool, mo little moving water. And this is Lanthanotus bornensis, otherwise known as the Borneo earless monitor. So this is our girl. Tiny little eyes, no ears. Unbelievable. They spend a lot of their time in streams and under dirt. They have a super prehensile tail that they they use to hold onto rocks. Uh, they lay eggs. In October, we got some eggs out of her, um, but unfortunately, it was in the middle of moving around a lot of. That's right. It's the water. It's not all the noise. That didn't. Um, <laughs> but we were moving around the lab a lot, and unfortunately, it uh, we we splashed some water into the substrate where they had the eggs, and the eggs drowned which was the most crushing day for me. Yeah, it, was um, it was a rough day, but so that's the girl. And what's cool with these guys is they're pretty dimorphic. So they're huge size difference. This is the male. 
Oh, yeah. So massive head size difference, body weight difference. Um, just amazing creatures. They also, they also, if he gets crabby, they have an anticoagulant in their saliva and razor blade teeth. They eat worms. They eat worms, and that's it. And they have the craziest bite for something that eats a worm. Um, but if you get bit, it's like being sliced by a perfectly sharp razor, and then you just don't stop bleeding for four or five hours. <laughs> It hasn't happened to me, fortunately. But, right. but for something that eats worms. So, yeah. so there you go. You have yeah, to Ryan it. has to hold one. I, I was about to say, I, I to let you hold one. the male. I'm going to let, she, she's still putting on weight, so we're going to let her go Click chill. But this guy's awesome looking. Yeah, I need to fill the waters too. Sorry I splashed that, but that's, yeah. that noise. that's like Stop. a dinosaur face. This is yeah. going to be the thumbnail for sure. I mean, these things are, it's stupid working with these. Every time I touch them, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. But it's the funny thing is you see them come, there's a decent amount of them in captivity compared to the wild population. Mm -hmm. um, they're being bred. There's at least four or five people in the U.S. that have been able to produce them. Um, but they move hands a lot. Mm -hmm. And you see them for sale and moving a lot because people get them because they're like, this is rad and super prehistoric and it's this evolutionary miracle. And then you get them, and it, the sand boas are more active. Yeah, like, right. They're very. They, they go yeah. under that cork, and they never come out. And then they go under the dirt, and they never come out. Like they don't bask, they don't do anything. They hide constantly. It's just like having an empty tank. Yeah. So they're not great display animals, which is something why you won't see zoos really working with them, because right. it would have to be a behind-the-scenes program they're working with, and it would be hard to get funding. They can't really promote something like that that people can't see. So it's hard to get sponsoring and funding and things for that. So this is one species that what's really cool, these got put on, uh, made CITES, uh, their CITES 2. They didn't go CITES 1 because that would have made it much more difficult for hobbyists to work with them. And the only like successful breedings that are happening around the world are almost all hobbyists. Yeah. So the, the, the species is gonna live on due to the hobbyists because zoos can't handle saving everything and this is a species that hobbies have really been able to make an impact on um, versus the zoos. That's fantastic. And th what's, what's causing them to basically go extinct is habitat loss. So every time you buy food that's got palm oil in it, their habitat is disappearing to palm oil farms. So, I mean, Not all palm oil, but yeah, a yeah, lot of it. I mean, make it. sure it's ethically sourced palm oil if it's in there, things like yeah. that. But your standard palm oil is just, it's Amazing. destroying enormous amounts of habitat in Borneo and Indonesia. Dude, that's so cool. Instagram that junk's Ryan. Jeez, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm yeah, living in the moment. Are, I know these things okay. are stupid. Yeah, little it's little hard to even way. realize that you're anywhere or there's anything to do. You're just like, oh my god. They're just like little wiggly salamanders. Yeah. They're so What's rad. really rad when they shed, so you see this like light cream on their sides? Yeah. Their skin turns brown immediately after they shed mm -hmm. with no tannins or anything. It just darkens. When they shed, that's ivory white and purple. Oh, wow. It's the coolest so How long does it take color. to color back? Within the next, by the next day, they look like this. Yeah, it's, it's fast. It's not that long. But, but it's, it's crazy because there's cool zero, it's, not like, it's not like viper boas that come in with their jungle skin where it's all tannins mm -hmm. and, and it's from the peat moss and stuff. That's their skin <laughs> that does that. Because that is, there's no tannins really in there. There's nothing that would stain them like that. Mm -hmm. But it turns dark 24 hours later. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Why is it so small? They're just a f an unbelievable animal. And this is a full-grown adult breeding pair. Like, they're a tiny little weird prehistoric lizard. They're just unreal cool. Yeah, they're amazing. I've, I've seen so many pictures and videos of them, but seeing them, being able to hold them, man. This is the first one you've ever gotten to touch? Absolutely. That's oh, awesome. for sure. It's, it's, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. No, I think cool. more people have touched this pair than the entire wild population. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I bet. So They tend to be the holy grail of the Zilla Tour. Yeah. So we're super thankful for having the behind the yeah, scenes dude, tour. It's awesome to see you guys this today. Thanks so much for coming amazing. out. It, it, guys, it's awesome here. Zilla does rule. Thank you so much to Bill and Ryan for showing us around. Uh, 
We're gonna put their links in the description. Please I'm sure, do. I'm sure you guys have never heard of Zilla, right? <laughs> if, you, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you don't, I still love just you. like it. Don't I even know the don't. I still love you. It's fine. Like this video. Share I'm this just video. Disappointed. Subscribe I'm to the YouTube mad. channel. <laughs> Stay tuned for all the cool stuff that they got coming up. This guy's a pro. <laughs> yeah, all that. Bye. <laughs> Peace out, guys. There's a wall. You don't have to say anything, you just be like, okay. say it look pretty. I think you got us? I hope. Yeah. <laughs> you got a little color here, so stay in the office. All right, you ready? Yeah. <clears throat> this is Bill. Uh, all right. <laughs> so we are super, super excited to, should I not say super excited? Because I'm racist. It's gonna be super excited. Super excited. We're all super excited. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta jump in the back up. We're here in Silla. <laughs> Whoa. Dude. <laughs>